had I sent it uh, Good evening. Could you for the uh, opening yeah. meeting laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we are being audio and video recorded this evening. Um, for those of you who are here tonight, thank you for coming. Um, and just to um, make sure that everyone's here for the right reason, um, this is a continuation of, a, of the public hearing that we began uh, dealing with the um, project on, on um, Seacorn Street. It's a zoning bylaw violation issue that we're dealing with this evening. It has nothing to do with the project itself. Uh, the uh, public hearings for the uh, development that's proposed for Seekonk will begin sometime this spring. Uh, so I just want to make sure everyone understands why we're here tonight. Uh, the, the, it has nothing to do with, with, the, um, with the project itself per se, but it's dealing with a zoning bylaw violation that the applicant is uh, now facing um, that we're dealing with. So the um, public, public hearings for the project itself will begin sometime this spring. So I just wanted to make sure everyone knew why we're here tonight and what the topic being discussed is. Um, so the um, issue that the board is dealing with tonight is a um, uh, originally a letter from the building commissioner um, finding the uh, applicant uh, pursuant to bylaw D1A1 uh, for non-residential uses, land clearing, excavation, filling, gravel removal, or clear cutting of trees in anticipation of any use permitted or authorized by these zoning bylaws, town bylaws, and regulations of the town of Norfolk and the planning board or laws of the Commonwealth is prohibited prior to issuance of all required approvals, permits, variances, licenses, and authorizations. Limited clearing and excavation is permitted to obtain necessary survey and engineering data or other activities required to secure necessary permits. So that's the specific bylaw that we're dealing with tonight. Uh, and in the opinion of the uh, building commissioner, the applicant has um, violated uh, the spirit and the um, intent of this bylaw. So, um, Let's begin by taking some testimony. We did receive a letter from um, Lorraine Sweeney. Lorraine, are you in the audience? Hi, hi Lorraine. Did you want to make a few comments uh, first? Do you want to have him present first? Of his plan, a plan, or do we want to let her do it first? No. no okay. Let's, let's get, her, okay. get her on record, and then we'll let them respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Lorraine Sweeney, 14 Stop River Road. Um, I had requested, I'd written a letter that the board required the applicant to perform an altar survey. And the reason for the request was um, basically I had accompanied the board and uh, the building inspector and some other butters on the sidewalk to take a look at the um, construction or gravel road that had been uh, put on the property and it was far more I would say the clearing and disturbance was exceeded what I expected it was going to be um, I live to the northeast of the property I um, had heard the trucks working up there for a couple of weeks and while my neighbors were all concerned that someone was putting a road up there, I kept saying, no, he's just digging test pits. That's his right. He should do that. He should investigate the subsurface situation up there. Um, so I was surprised when I went on the sidewalk and saw what really had happened. Um, I then had really no way of assessing where we were as we got about halfway into the walk because most of the um, flags that would have told us where we were. A lot of them had been moved or weren't there. Uh, so I then um, thought, well, really, I'll go back to some earlier plans and maybe I can orient myself. This is after the walk and see exactly where it is and what transpired. And uh, one of the representations that was made during the site walk um, was that the road really was just a widening of an existing roadway that already existed. Um, so I went to some earlier existing conditions plans that had been submitted to the town of Norfolk for an earlier application. They did show cart paths on the property, but they weren't in that part of the property. 
So I then went to the um, appellant's uh, filing that he had made for the comprehensive permit to see whether those existing conditions plans showed an existing roadway or cart paths that didn't reflect that either. So at that point, I said, this is ridiculous. I mean, from my standpoint, there's no way for me to assess the tree, the proximity to wetland resource areas, which there is some, for instance, we have a vernal pool on our property, and we are contiguous, like I said, on the northeast of the site. Um, so I just requested the gold standard of a survey. Typically, an ALTA survey is only required for land title purposes, but I thought, it's a good starting point, but in addition to you know just saying this is what the expectation would be for a survey, um, I did also include some additional specifications in my letter that it be two foot contours and in, in the disturbed areas that there be uh, spot grades on a 10 foot grid. Um, additionally, um, looking for identification of trees with um, caliper and species because again, it helps one to assess exactly what happened out there and then make a reasonable decision as to how one would go about restoring or mitigating what's already happened. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bob, did you want to um, kind of uh, t tell a little bit about the, how this whole process started and, and why you initiated the letter? I had a neighbor come in to the office uh, stating that they thought that the um, uh, contractor was on their property uh, when they, uh, so I made an appointment, I had called uh, Mr. O'Hart and made an appointment to go out there and take a look at it the next day. Uh, he obliged and I went out and we basically followed the, uh, the property lines, uh, found that um, the neighbor wasn't correct, they weren't on our property. Um, they were a bit of a distance away, but the um, you know when I started walking back there, it was pretty evident that they had done a lot more work than what's typical of a um, site walk. The uh, site walks generally, uh, when they're doing testing, uh, they're going over the natural um, grade, the natural um, vegetation, going around the trees uh, to points along the, in the subdivision, future subdivision to dig the test holes, um, either where the buildings are going or where the uh, storm water or the septic systems would be going. So um, as we started walking back, it was pretty evident that they had graveled in a, a number of areas, um, creating almost a roadway all the way back um, through the property. And when you get back to the point where the, the property turns to the right, uh, there's also a trail that you can see in this plan here that goes up on the left and that was in um, th that was pretty much what I expected to see. It was untouched. It was the machine had gone over the natural grade, dug the test holes here and there. Whereas in the other areas, the they had uh, dug out large areas of gravel, um, which I presume they used in the dry in the roadway <coughs> uh, to level off the roadways and create a wider um, um, base for the road to uh, drive you know, vehicles back there of, of any kind. So, you know, I, I told them at that point that they need to fill in the um, the holes. A lot of them were open. Uh, they're, you know, deeper than the four feet that they should have been. So, um, you know, I told them to stop work order at that point, other than to go back in there the next day or two, you know, fill in all these holes, which he did. I asked them to uh, talk to the DPW director about how he was going to um, deal with the entranceway from Seekonk Street. There's a hill that's coming down, and we didn't want to see uh, the um, uh, the subsoil and loom being washed out onto uh, Seekonk Street. So I had him talk to uh, the DPW director and ask him how he wanted to handle that. And uh, he had him put some hay bales up, a fence, somewhat of a berm to make sure that nothing ran out onto the street. So. Um, so Hart took care of all those things within a matter of a few days, uh, and you know he sent the the letter out, you know, putting the stop work order on and 
a fine uh, based on the um, section D1A1 of the zoning bylaws. So. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Um, Mr. Hart. Comments? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, for the record, Rob Kanapik, I'm uh, counsel to Mr. O'Hart. And I just wanted to um, uh, confirm that uh, this evening is a, um, a hearing and an appeal, as I think you cast it at the last meeting, of a uh, determination by the building inspector that Mr. O'Hart uh, violated section D1A1 of the um, Norfolk Zoning Board, uh, sorry, the Norfolk Zoning Bylaw. Um, I think I'm, I think you would agree that that is the sort of the procedural uh, uh, posture of this evening. This is a, a hearing on an appeal of a building inspector's notice of violation. Um, so, um, assuming you agree with that, and if you don't, please say so. Um, I believe that um, the town would have the burden of demonstrating that uh, Mr. O'Hart violated the particular section of the zoning bylaw by presenting uh, evidence to the board that uh, Mr. O'Hart has violated that section. And presumably the town and uh, the building inspector would um, uh, argue that they have presented evidence to the board. Uh, although there's been no documentary evidence, there was a site visit at which um, the building inspector had the opportunity to point out what he believed to be the violations and uh, certain members of the board had the opportunity to view the property to um, uh, have their own uh, first-hand view. Um, I think then that like you, you uh, as sort of a court sitting as judge and jury this evening, Mr. O'Hart would then have the opportunity to present evidence to refute that claim by the town um, and to show that um, he did not violate section D1A1 of the zoning bylaw. And so that is what we're uh, prepared to do and would like to do this evening. Uh, but I did want to confirm that the board agrees that that's the sort of the, the process that we're in. Is that correct? Do you agree with that? You're appealing the uh, building commissioner's uh, Finds that he's levied That's against right. the applicant. Yes. Notice of violation. Notice yes. Of violation. Okay. Right. So um, before we um, present the evidence that we'd like to present to you this evening, which is in the form of a survey that was prepared in response to a request and also a testimony from Mr. O'Hara and testimony from um, his engineer, Mr. O'Connell, um, I'd like to discuss with the board a threshold matter that it appears that a reasonable reading of section D1A1, uh, well, first of all, want to establish or stipulate that this work was done in preparation for a residential development. I assume that the board is aware um, and that the board has received uh, correspondence uh, that indicates that Mr. O'Hart has prepared um, uh, or, or rather applied for a project eligibility letter for mass housing to construct a uh, residential uh, affordable housing project on the property. And so I further assume that the board and the, the town at large for that matter is aware that this is in preparation for a residential uh, uh, project. So I would ask the board um, why section D1A1 applies to the work done uh, by Mr. O'Hart to design his project because that section seems to exclude residential uses in that it says for non-residential uses. In other words, I read the section to say if land clearing or excavation is done for non-residential uses, then you must um, have all permits before doing so. That would seem to imply that if land clearing or excavation is done for residential uses, 
then it's not necessary to first have all required approvals, permits, and variances. Am I correct in my reading of that section of the bylaw? Are you reading section D1A2? D1A1. I, I understand we're on D1A1, right? Is he looking at D1A2 where it says uh, may be performed? I'm just, trying to, what? I'm, just, I'm just trying to understand, are you referring to the next section of the no, bylaw? I'm referring to D1A1. I'll, I'll read, uh, I'll parse the language a, a little bit. But well, why, don't let, why don't we let the building inspector, the building commissioner who issued the fine, mm -hmm. explain why he picked that as a zoning Fair bylaw? Enough. Since that is what we're looking at. <coughs> this this clearing of the land wasn't made for uh, residential lots. It was made for a road. So th a road isn't, a, isn't considered a residential. Uh, so I would consider this non-residential because you're building roads to it. When you're, build when you're taking a lot for a specific house, then I would go to the other uh, bylaw and say it's for residential. So. Okay, but <coughs> I assume you don't mean to suggest that the project that Mr. O'Hart proposes is simply the construction of roads. It's, it's more than that, correct? Uh, what he cleared was for the roads. I understand. Where, where he took down the trees was for the roads. Well, uh, I don't know that we agree with that, but in any event, do, do you, does the board understand that the project is a residential project? Does the building inspector understand that the project is a residential project? I understand that. Okay. That's clear. Then it's not, given that it's a residential project and not a non-residential project, how does this section apply? Because it's, otherwise I don't see what the purpose of the words for non-residential uses is in that section of the bylaw. Again, it seems to suggest that if you need to clear land and excavate, and test for non-residential uses, like a, an office building or a commercial building or a strip mall, then, and, and this, that makes some sense, that's a use that typically involves clear-cutting large areas, perhaps, for parking lots and the like. But any, in any event, it says for non-residential uses, for example, the ones I mentioned, an office building, a strip mall, <coughs> You can't excavate, fill, remove gravel, or clear-cut trees unless you have all permits first. So that would seem to imply that for residential uses, you don't need all permits. Otherwise, I, 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 I kind of look at it differently. I look at it differently. I, I look at it as saying <clears throat> it, the, the precursor to that says for all new residential dwellings, uh, they need relief from the building for the building commissioner. Okay. Then, if they don't get that relief, they can appeal it. And, and it seems to me that in addition to residential, it also includes non-residential, land clearing, excavation, filling, anything. So it appears to be in addition to residential. That's how I look at it. Okay. It's not that it is, it is excluding um, uh, residential in this okay. context. Also, if, as I go down to, again, D1A2, <coughs> which then further elaborates on <coughs> individual lots for single family dwellings within an approved subdivision or a plan endorsed by the planning board. So that seems to me a further clarification of basic <coughs> requirements for residential dwellings. If I'm, <clears throat> I, I read also, it says the word, uh, the sentence reads, for non-residential uses, land clearing, excavation, filling, gravel removal, or clear cutting of trees. <clears throat> the word or to me suggests that any of those would apply. I, and in this case, land clearing did apply and that's why this bylaw would take effect. Lorraine, did you want to weigh in on this topic t as well? You have a microphone. 
Rob, could you hand that to Lorraine, please? Thank you. As I was listening to your discussion, the other thing I was thinking, Mr. Hanson, when you said on an approved subdivision, a single lot, this is a non-conforming lot. Um, there's only 125 feet of frontage at the street, and there's supposed to be 200 in the R3 district, and at the lot width, I think it's like 145 or something, but there isn't the required frontage, um, so it's not even a legal single-family lot. I mean, uh, I, I look at the very first sentence, all applicants for new residential dwellings. Yeah, that's, that's the very that's first that's uh, that's sentence uh, that uh, overlays this entire regulation. So we do not agree with you. Uh, if I, no, I agree. speaking in turn, Same say comment. so, but does everyone agree with that interpretation? Okay. In common. Chris? Yes. Okay. So um, your, your argument, uh, we're not buying your argument. Okay, but fair this, enough. Th this deals with residential dwellings and... We uh, would... Um, certainly reserve our right to to make that on appeal if, if that should become necessary so be it. Um, but I, I uh, appreciate your considering it and um, rendering the um, uh, response that you did um, so um, as I said you know I believe that uh, procedurally uh, again this is a violation a notice of violation from the building inspector that's being appealed it's the town's burden to show that Mr. O'Hart violated that section. Um, presumably, they've, uh, the town has done whatever they're going to do in order to meet that burden. Um, I don't anticipate that there'll be any more evidence provided to you. Um, so I believe then it would now be uh, Mr. O'Hart's uh, right and obligation to um, present whatever evidence he'd like to present to you to refute that evidence, and then I think it's your job to weigh the evidence presented to you to make a determination as to whether or not the, um, uh, a there is a violation of the bylaw. So um, we would like to present to the board um, a, uh, an affidavit of, could you take one? And, yes, thank you. An affidavit of uh, Stephen O'Connell, who's here. Um, and we'll make a presentation to you and um, that affidavit sets forth certain facts relevant to what you are to consider this evening. I'll give you a moment to read it. chance to review the uh, document. That's going to be entered in as testimony. <coughs> yeah, I think we. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Kanapika, did you want to continue? Did you want to continue? Uh, if you're, if you've had an opportunity to review Mr. O'Connell's affidavit, um, thank you. So, uh, I would like for Mr. O'Connell to uh, mm -hmm. speak to you, to uh, present evidence of his qualifications to speak to you, to present evidence of um, on how many occasions he has been engaged in uh, testing of this sort for this type of project, 
Uh, the methods used for the testing that was done on this property, why testing was done, where it was done, what the objective of the testing was, um, and also I would like him to explain not only why the uh, testing was done um, that was done uh, several weeks or months ago that's the subject of this violation, but what uh, testing remains to be done on the property uh, for any necessary final design of the uh, proposed improvements to the property, um, and also to make reference to the plan that he's prepared for your uh, edification this evening. Good evening, thank you. Uh, Mr. Knappick uh, stated, my name is Steve O'Connell from Andrews Survey and Engineering. I'm a licensed soil evaluator, uh, civil engineer. I've been uh, working in this industry uh, for over 20 years, and uh, this is what we do. We do land, we do strictly land development for all sorts, residential, commercial, industrial, uh, et cetera. And uh, the, cons the testing that was performed out there is absolutely consistent with the testing we do on, on projects just like this uh, all over the state. We identify areas throughout the site that need to be tested uh, for stormwater, uh, on-site sanitary sewage disposal, uh, depths to bedrock, depths to groundwater, soil types, whether they're consistent with uh, NRCS mapping, um, soil conditions that you know we know what to expect during construction from a cost analysis from materials we expect to find. Um, as we approach the testing date of this particular piece of property. Uh, in <coughs> consultation with Mr. O'Hart, we staked by instrument survey the property boundaries, so we knew the extent of the property. We had performed wetland evaluation and located the wetlands by, uh, again, by instrument survey for accuracy. We had a uh, topographic survey completed, and as you uh, probably are aware, we had site eligibility from Mass Housing based on a fairly comprehensive uh, plan that had been prepared up to that point in time. So we had indications of where we believed roads and units would go if the, the project were to move forward, which uh, it is as a conference of permit has been submitted to this board. So for that reason, uh, we knew where roads were going to go. We provided some staking for Mr. O'Hart to follow with his uh, small excavator. He didn't get a large excavator, a small excavator so he could maneuver uh, without providing any additional disturbance than what was necessary to perform the testing. If you've seen the comprehensive permit plan, you'll recognize that the road layout on this plan here is very similar to the road layout on the comprehensive plan. And the reason that's the case is because why wouldn't we follow the roads that we intend to build? Why would we, why would we, do, why would we go in areas where roads aren't going to go and then go ahead and build the roads and make additional disturbance. So we followed the roads because we intend for the roads to go there so we could limit the disturbance. The way that this plan is drawn is these black dashed lines are the locations of existing paths, roads, trails, whatever you want to call them, that we found when we entered the property from day one, uh, long before soil testing. The purple lines that you see on the plane here were uh, additional paths that Mr. O'Hart created in order to access different parts of the property for testing. All of these symbols here, which don't show up too clearly here, but I think you can ascertain what they are. One, two, three, four, five, six, they're all over the site. Those are test pit locations that were performed uh, for a variety of reasons, as I indicated. Stormwater, soil, t uh, on-site septic, uh, general knowledge of the soils on site for construction when the time comes. And the other important aspect that's probably unique to this site is that going into this testing, uh, and I think most people in this room who are following this project believe that this site was a terrible site. They believe that this site was full of ledge and bedrock and none buildable. And I know, I know that that's the opinion uh, because I had looked at this piece of property uh, from uh, uh, in a butter 
who had interest in this property some time ago when there was a project proposed. There's been records of testing on this property. You can find on file the Board of Health Office. A subdivision was proposed from uh, Stop River uh, all the way out through Seekonk, and it just didn't move forward. So Mr. O'Hart was determined to ascertain the aspects of this property that were critical to him and critical to us for design, and that was the depth and presence of the ledge that everyone talked about. So there are some areas that required some extensive excavation. For example, down in this area, I think Betsy had the photo up a few minutes ago. There was some extensive excavation in that area because we were to determine to define the extent of the ledge. When, when, we, when it was found, um, you know, it was documented. The material that was there was used in certain areas just to provide some leveling and future access for vehicles to get back here for future testing. There'll be more testing needed that'll be witnessed by the Board of Health, uh, be witnessed by possibly peer review engineers. So for access to the site, uh, Mr. O'Hart certainly did uh, make that, that access a little more uh, manageable. We deliberately avoided uh, wetland sensitive areas. Again, um, this is the testing that we performed out there is consistent with hundreds of test sites that I've personally performed on projects similar to this in nature. So that's, that's my position on the situation. Okay, can I just ask a, Thank you. a, a procedural question? So <clears throat> is this an issue of Mr. O'Hart simply not obtaining the proper permit from, from your office in order to proceed with, so he goes to the state, the state apparently grants him a letter of which states in there something to the effect of um, he should perform some testing. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, had he, uh, does he, uh, this may be a ridiculous question, but does he just simply not have a permit to proceed? Is, no, that, is it, that the issue here? It comes down to, if you look at the northeast corner of that subdivision that he's got drawn there, where it goes up and swings around. That area, he went over the existing grade that was there. There was no disturbance to anything other than the test pits that were done. You talking about this part, Bob? Yep, yeah, all the way up to the top of the hill there. So I had no problem with that area. What I had a problem with is from that point where it meets the other road going south, all of that got uh, graveled in all the way around, and oh. trees got taken out. Okay, so he did get that. a permit to do the, the initial phase? No, there's no permits yet, because right now he's doing testing. And I understand that he has to do testing, but I don't understand why uh, they could do it correctly up in that northeast corner, but not in the rest of it going down. As well as from uh, Seekonk going up to that point, that was all graveled in. There's one area that's, you know, probably 100 feet long by, you know, 75 feet wide that's all graveled in and, and leveled off. And, you know, I was there right after it was done. It was all clean gravel. Um, now he's put some loom down and throws some seed down. So now you have some grass growing up around it. But it's just, you know, I've been in this business for 35 years. and. I've never seen anybody, you know, uh, without permits, gravel in a road like that um, without uh, permits ahead of time. You know, if they went in and they, they treated it like that northeast corner, you would have had no issues with me. Well, my only response is that I don't think it's practical to get up this to this high point with a vehicle, you know, like a pickup truck. So that, that's just due to the grade. So that was the reason why Mr. O'Hart didn't spend the effort going up that section, you know, graveling something in because just, it's just too steep to get up there with a pickup truck when the time comes for future testing. This area is relatively flat. So taking the stumps out, taking things that are gonna, you know, hit an oil pan, hit a transmission pan, hit something on the bottom of a, of a vehicle, like, you know, a pickup truck that Mr. O'Hart drives or I drive for that matter, or, or the uh, Board of Health agent drives. Um, getting access in there for water, for, for perk testing, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's a realistic thing. Um, you know, we just got a 92 lot subdivision approved in Rentham. 
uh, right over the town line, we did the same thing. The, uh, the, the, the builder, developer, cut a, you know, cut a road in enough for his equipment and his pickup truck. We had 92 lots of, you know, a lot of, a lot of soil testing have, has been done there so far. Uh, it's very similar <coughs> circumstance. Um, I can speak personally and I'll testify to this, you know, in, in this setting or, or any other setting. I was on the property before, several times before we did testing. In this large area, I think Bob, you're referring to, that was very wide and very flat. With the exception of, of natural vegetation that started to grow in over time, this area was, was devastated. And I, you know, if you go on Google Earth and you go back to 2009 and every year forward, it's, it's clear as day. It shows up. I've got some photographs from 2013 I brought with me. You can see this trail go up and go around. It follows this exact pattern. And you get to this area, it's this huge clearing. You know, of course vegetation is going to start to grow. And then once you drive a machine over it and you turn it on the tracks, that's where we were, we were parking until we could get future acts, you know, to get further access in there. So you got vehicles and equipment turning on the material. The vegetation gets all disturbed. Mr. O'Hart put some gravel that he had excavated from that area out and laid, and laid it all out. So when, you, when you're there, right when it's done, it, it looks devastated. I'm sure it does, but, you know, especially relatively speaking to undisturbed areas. Yeah, excuse me, but I'm, I'm still a little bit confused. So, yeah, I, I can actually try well, to address the, that. But let me see. Though, so procedurally then, so what happens is somebody wants to develop a piece of land. <clears throat> And by default, you, you def by default, you basically can't do anything on the land until they come to you folks. Is that, is that correct? No. no. It's not correct. Okay. No. They, okay. they go out there and they do testing, similar to what I just said, okay. up in that northeast corner. They're not graveling in. They're not taking trees down. They just they'll, they use track machines that can go over pretty much any grade, uh, including the grade on the lower area there was a pretty steep grade and he still went up and down that with his excavator um, and didn't you know gravel it in you know and that's what it's coming down to it's how much work do you allow them to do without getting the proper permits in place and generally speaking what he did in the northeast corner is exactly what should have been done not take the gravel out of the test holes and they were huge test holes these weren't just you know, uh, you know, a bucket's width or a couple bucket's width. This is like 30, 40 feet wide by 10 feet wide, and they excavated out the gravel, and then they spread that gravel out on the road. It just isn't normal, uh, you know. I, uh, okay. So, uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Okay, just, yeah, all right. Particularly, sir. I think I think mass housing. I know mass housing put that stipulation in their approval letter because of the concerns that they received from abutters during their approval and review process. Uh, that testing was a critical component of this project. So, okay. I mean, the the general population's belief of the unbuildability of this site, um, you know, concerned us. Concerned Mr. O'Hart. So some of those. You know, extraordinary testings was really just chasing out potential ledge. You know, because you see ledge on the surface or near the surface, uh, you you test, you dig. We find this beautiful gravel. That's fantastic. Let's let's keep going to the right or keep going to the left. So so what does a person do then if you get to a point? If you get to that northeast corner and everything's fine, and then you want to proceed, I guess it'd be what south on the land, and the only way to do that is to fill in areas and so is that when they, they didn't have to fill in those areas they could have just tracked over to it just like they did on that upper section they, that's a fairly steep section on that northeast corner so if they can travel up a hill to make those those um, test pits they could do the same thing on level ground okay there, was, there wasn't a need to to um, you know knock down as many trees as they did and and do the um, and lay you know a roads with um, of, of gravel down, that, and that's what it comes down to. Okay. It's just they can actually they could travel the way they wanted. They're just stepping it up, you know, in the construction process earlier than they should have. Okay. St Steve, could you comment on? <coughs> could you bring up that picture that I sent to you, please? Because I I snapped one picture during our walkthrough. Yep. Um, 
which she's going to bring up here. And um, my understanding was this was to test for ledge. Am I correct? Yes. It, it, it's, an, it's an area I couldn't tell you how wide it is. I couldn't tell you how high it is, but it's got to be at least six feet high in the back, Bob. Uh, at least. At least, okay. Yeah. And, and, and I, I don't know how wide. Um, but all this soil went someplace, and I assume it went down to fill in the <coughs> area to make a road. Or, or, road. or was carried off site. Yeah, it wasn't, nothing left the site. It was okay. carried off. Right. Sometimes when you don't have such good material on site, you've got to import to make an access road. Because when you remove, when you, when, you, when you knock trees and you remove stumps, you've got pretty big holes in the ground. You're not going to get a pickup truck over the ground with, with a three or four foot deep hole from a big stump from a, you know, 20 inch oak tree. But, but this, this area here that you, you acknowledge, it's a huge excavated out area. Right. Because this, this was in the area where there's the topography and some ledge on the surface. Giant boulders. Indicates that we, we believe that there was potential for ledge there. We wanted to evaluate the conditions on site to know where we can fit a shared septic system, where we can put storm water. Is it realistic to have units in this location? Are we going to have to blast? You know, because as you know, in a, in a comprehensive permit, we've got to provide pro forma numbers on, on blasting. So there are, there are aspects about this that we're going to get into in a separate public hearing process that, you know, I, we think this was our due diligence to be able to answer those questions during the comprehensive permit process, which you know we'll 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 get to. Given if 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 that is a reasonable response, I guess my question would be: So you took all this stuff out, you dug down, you either found or didn't find whatever it was. But why wasn't it put back? Why was it carefully spread out along the next 100, 200 feet of roadway? Because we were looking to provide access for future testing, access with pickup trucks. So if you don't use gravel that you have or material, suitable material that you find on site to make some of those access roads passable with a pickup truck or whatever, you know, vehicle that, like I have a pickup truck, Mr. O'Hara has a pickup truck. I know that the uh, Board of Health agent has a pickup truck, but you know, maybe other town officials that come out there, will, you know, have a Crown Victoria, but not, I don't expect them to drive that up there. But a pickup truck can, can be, is now, can be drived into the site for additional testing. You can transport water, you can transport tools. Since we had the material on site which was suitable for this use, we're able to use it. Otherwise, like, like I mentioned a few minutes ago on that site in Rentham, they imported material, some material. They, they had some good material on site, but instead of bringing it from, you know, a thousand feet away on the other side of the site, it was easier to import, you know, so, 80 or, or 100 so, so for the record, are you saying that the evaluation of soil conditions justifies making uh, the, the access accessible to a pickup truck? I think it's a byproduct of the testing. If we did soil testing here and we found ledge, and we went three feet down and found ledge, you know, topsoil, subsoil, maybe some gravel, a foot of gravel then ledge, and we and we needed to get back to other testing, other areas for future testing, Mr. O'Hart would have had to consider importing. Well, some that, that wasn't my question. My, my question was that, that you, you're stating that you need normal soil evaluation um, and, and ground evaluation requires access via pickup trucks versus access via track vehicles or, or you know, front end loaders. Large, you large sites like this, it's common. You're saying that's, that's normal? It's common on large sites like this, yeah. Because when you have to do percolation tests for septic systems, you've got to transport water back there. But if I may, I, um, I'd like to raise um, or, or focus on an issue that Mr. Luciano uh, I think quite rightly brought up when he said a few minutes ago, I, I think I'm paraphrasing a little, but I think you said, you know, let me get this straight. If somebody needs to do testing on their property to design a subdivision, say, you know, they've got to come to you first, and you're pointing to the building inspector. Um, you know, I, I don't think that's really the issue because I don't read D1A1 to set up 
a sort of a, a permitting process for testing. In other words, I don't read this, and I don't think anywhere in here you could read it to say, if you're going to do testing on your property, you've got to apply for a permit. And here's the section that you refer to in order to get that permit. It doesn't say that. In fact, it says that if you're going to clear land or excavate or fill or remove gravel or clear cut trees, you have to have all permits. So that implies that um, you have to have, if it's a subdivision, say your definitive subdivision approval um, and an order of condition from the uh, Conservation Commission. That implies that if it's an office building, you have to have a, a special permit from you if that's required or site plan review. Because clearly it says you can't do any of that stuff until you have all required approvals, permits, variances, licenses, and authorizations. So I don't think, as, as you seem to, to speculate, Mr. Luciano, <laughs> that D1A1 sets up a separate permit process. So what does it do? It seems to require uh, or to prohibit um, land clearing, excavation, et cetera, until you have all permits. But that can't mean, can it, that you can't go on the property to do the testing necessary to get those permits. Uh, if it does mean that, then it certainly sets up a, a sort of a chicken and an egg problem. Because how do you get the permits unless you can go on the site to do the testing necessary to even apply for the permits? I think really though the issue is, um, and that wasn't, that's not the issue here because Mr. O'Hart doesn't have the permits. We can all acknowledge that. Uh, he doesn't have all required approvals. He did the testing in order to apply for them. And I would submit to the board a copy of the project eligibility letter that Mr. O'Connell refers to that says, for example, the municipality is concerned that site conditions represent a significant cr constraint to development. There are several areas defined by hills and steep slopes with rock outcroppings, which contribute to further concern. The municipality is concerned that the land may not be suitable to handle the 244 bedroom pro bedrooms proposed with a shared septic system and believes soil boring should be done throughout the site. So as was, and I'll offer this to you as you know, further evidence that as was said, what Mr. O'Hart was doing is simply his due diligence, as, as Mr. O'Connell put it, or the work necessary to satisfy those concerns, to determine depth to ledge, to determine soil permeability and soil suitability. Finally, um, I think really the issue is the very last sentence of D1A1. We understand that the building inspector received a complaint. He did what he had to do. He responded to the complaint. You know, we don't take objection to that. He, this matter is before you. <coughs> I think what it comes down to is for you to decide whether or not what was done was, th the testing that was done was limited clearing and excavation to obtain necessary survey and engineering data to design, in this case, a residential project on the property <coughs> and to secure in this case, a comprehensive permit. And as evidence, uh, because if that's what was done, then there is no violation of D1A1. I don't know that we've heard evidence saying that we exceeded that standard of limited clearing and excavation. The building inspector has said that in 35 years, you've never seen roads graveled, but I'm sure the building inspector would agree that typically building inspectors aren't involved at this stage in the process, they receive building permit applications, they act on them, that's long after testing was done to design a subdivision, etc. On the other hand, you have evidence in Mr. O'Connell's testimony and in his sworn affidavit that yes, in fact, what was done was limited clearing and excavation for the purpose of obtaining the data to obtain permits. So I would suggest to you that if in fulfilling your charge to weigh the evidence presented to you as to whether or not that particular portion of D1A1 was violated, that you must conclude based on the evidence that it was not, and we hope you do. Um, and if you do so conclude, then we hope that you would uh, find that Mr. O'Hart did not violate the bylaw, is not subject to fines. Thank you. Thank you.
All right. Um, questions or comments from folks that are here this Mike, evening? Mike, can I make a quick, oh, yes, go quick, ahead. quick comment? Yeah, okay. um, with regards to uh, what we were talking about in D1A1, it says limited clearing and excavation is permitted to obtain the necessary survey and engineering data. However, it, it does not say filling is permitted to obtain the necessary survey and engineering <coughs> data. However, at the beginning of D1A1, it says for non-residential uses, land clearing, excavation, filling, gravel removal, or clear cutting of trees. And filling, uh, I think, was done on this site as you have stated. I suppose that depends what's meant by filling. I, I, I doubt the bylaw defines filling. So it's for us to determine, for you to determine, I suppose, and perhaps it's on a case-by-case -case basis of what filling is. Now, I think we can all agree that in the normal use of that word and its normal application of that word to land development, filling is probably not taking a relatively small amount of gravel from here and placing it in a location where there's already a cart road to, <coughs> say, level a rut or a ditch. That essentially is what was done here. I think we can all agree that filling is more like raising the grade several feet in order to, say, construct improvements like a parking lot. Um, if you construe or define the word filling as used there to mean the placement of any soil, then I would suggest to you, you're going to have a lot of violations of the zoning bylaw uh, to act upon. Uh, but y y that's, I suppose, your prerogative to construe the bylaw. That's your job. Uh, and, and to determine that filling means placing essentially any, any fill. Does that make sense? <coughs> I understand your argument. Mm -hmm. well, sir. Okay, questions from folks that are here or comments? Yes, ma'am. Can you um, grab the microphone and identify uh, your name and address? Um, good evening, um, members of the board. My name is Deborah Gersha. I live at 143 Seekonk Street, directly across from the proposed housing project. Um, to just start off, I just want to give you a little bit of background on, on myself. I was in um, Medfield prior to moving to Norfolk, and I served on the, the Board of Health in Medfield, involved with Title V septic systems and permitting for the Title V septic systems. Currently, I actually have registration as a certified safety professional specializing in constru construction safety, and I also serve on National Fire Protection Association Committee 241, which is called Construction Demolition. So what happens with this is I have a pretty good background in construction <coughs> safety. I want to counter about the size of the excavator. My husband, Jim, and I live directly across from the proposed housing project, and during the month of August, we heard and we witnessed that excavator going up and down that hill almost on an 18-hour basis. So it was pretty light out during that time. Mr. Warhart went to town with that property trying to clear cut as much as he could. We watched and we listened and we knew something was wrong because based on my experience, you cannot get started without that amount of work without the proper projects and permits being filed. And on top of it also is that property is a mess right now. Hay bales all over the place fluorescent signs out to the street. And the other thing is the native species that were there were all clear cut it. And we're asking if that property can be tidied up to have some reasonable appearance. But I counter that Mr. Hart's representative saying not much, not much work was done. And in fact, there was heavy excavation done on the property. We all heard it and we all saw it <coughs> because it was the summertime and the daylight was out for several hours and we all witnessed it in the whole neighborhood on Seekonk Street. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, Larry Clark, 130 Seekonk Street. Um, mm -hmm. Both sides yeah. here, no. it appears that it's more of a matter of opinion to just what extent uh, Mr. O'Hart did or did not go beyond just to, to, uh, digging test holes. Um, but in my 45 years plus in construction, when it deals to any kind of permitting or, or laws, whether they're electrical code, building codes, plumbing codes, it states right in the law that 
the building inspector or wire inspector, the local inspector has the final say on the interpretation of the law. So it would seem to me that in this case, Mr. Bullock's opinion would overrule any opinion that Mr. Hart or his counsel has. Thank you. Thank you. Lorraine, yes. Lorraine Sweeney again. Um, my other concern and the reason I requested an ALTA survey is that uh, right now there's an abbreviated notice of resource area delineation in front of the Conservation Commission. I know they have uh, retained TetraTech to review it from a technical standpoint, but I'm concerned because they never had an opportunity, the Conservation Commission didn't, to walk the property and approve the wetlands boundaries. And based on the extent of clearing, I don't know. For instance, um, on one of the site walks, we did um, that Janet DeLonga, I believe her name is. She's the conservation agent. She thought she had seen um, another wetland area closer to Seekonk Street. And I can't say whether she did or didn't. I don't want to represent that she did. But the problem is, now that this has been filled and um, trees have been taken down, a lot of the vegetation that one might have used to identify the wetland area, um, or and she said she had seen a vernal pool, she thought. Again, I don't know. These are things she said during the walk, but that is now covered up because you have this gravel road in the area she was talking about. So I think it does speak to the need for an ALTA survey because we'd have to reconcile what, let's say, a different conservation commission granted it was 10 years ago, but said the limits of the wetlands were on that property and the much smaller wetlands resource area that's presently delineated. And without that survey to reconcile the two, um, I just don't know how any of the boards can make their decisions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll make a comment. Is that <coughs> I'm not a contractor. I'm not an engineer. I'm certainly not a soil expert, but it would seem to me if you're going to dig test sites, test holes, to, you go in there and whatever equipment you need, you dig a hole and you determine what you need to determine and you put the soil back in and then you go to the next location and you dig a hole and you do the same thing. It, it does not seem to me logical to say we're going to dig a hole and we're going to take all this dirt we needed to take out to find out what we needed, and then we're going to proceed to so we can run pickup trucks at some future date in basically the same location as we would propose to put a road in. That, to me, is not... Yeah, yeah but the argument there was, the argument was that, that so <clears throat> and maybe you can get an excavator uh, across this terrain to dig a hole, but now you may have to bring a, a water truck down there. The only way to do that is to is to create a road. And so, really, my question goes to one of my question goes to one of if it is absolutely necessary to start pushing earth around in order to f to to do what you have to do in preparation. So, to either do this limited clearing exca or excavation that is permitted to obtain necessary surveying engineering data or other activities required to secure necessary permits. So all this precedes permits. And in order to do this, my question would be is procedurally, how do you do that? So d at what point does a landowner n not have the right to move about his own land? And at what point does government step in and say, hey, wait a minute, there's things called vernal pools, and there's things called trees and vegetation that can't be disturbed. I just don't know where that, where that line is drawn. I I and so it's... And I don't think it's a question of whether or not you have to put a road, if you have to put a road in, in order to get a water truck down there so you can do a, a, a test pit, then do you put the road in? You know, what do you do? You know, do you get a permit for it? Do you stop at that point and say, wait a minute, I think I need a permit at this point? Yes, I, look I, at the I just don't know. I, don't I, I look at the word limited, clearing and excavation, okay? And I don't believe that's putting a road in. That's that's fr from how I look at this whole thing. That's my picture. I took that. I just don't logistically. I don't know how you do it. Uh, you know, do you stop at a certain point and proceed with a permit process at that point? Or so I don't know. Do you, do you, do you do you go to the town? Do you say, hey, gee, you know what? I think we might have to fill in this area because we need to get that truck down here. We can't do it. 
The truck's going to flip over if we don't stabilize that ground. Does the, what happens? I just don't. I literally do not know what you do in that point. That's why I'm trying to figure out the logistics and the logic behind this process. And was something violated? I'd just like to add that for anyone in the, in their mind who's thinking that Mr. O'Hart was building roads in advance of the project is mistaken because that's not how you build roads. You know, you just don't take some, you know, some gravel borrow you find on site and, and throw it on the ground. I mean, some serious excavation and compaction has to happen to build a road to the standard that these roads would ultimately be built to. The roads that are there are just simply temporary access roads for access, and, and they're simply that. So much more goes into excavation uh, for, for roads that are going to become permanent roads that provide access to a residential project. Extensive land clearing, you know, and I mean extensive, not not what not what you see out there. That is not extensive land clearing. That is that is selective clearing, um, extensive land clearing, extensive cuts and fills. You know, cuts as as you know as much as six to ten plus feet and fills as much as six to ten plus feet. You know, and then when you get to those cuts and fills, you have embankments that have to be sloped off. You know, in a fill or or a cut scenario, um, you've got utilities that are going to have to go in the ground. You got manholes pipes, conduit, uh, all th things of that nature. So when you think about a road, you know, maybe in your free time, drive around town and see a subdivision that's, that's maybe being built and go look at what goes into that road. Just, just the width alone will tell you that what Mr. O'Hart did out here is strictly temporary for access, f you know, for means uh, of access for additional soil testing and, you know, due diligence process for his project. Oh. Mr. Chairman, may I just respond quickly? I, I, I know you, the hour is getting on, and I heard there's a baseball game tonight, so I will be as brief as I can. Thank you. Um, the, just a few points to respond to. It was said that uh, there was the clear cutting of the property. He clear cut as much as he could. It's a mess up there. I trust that those members of the board who were on the site visit would agree that the site is anything but clear cut. In fact, um, if you saw, I'm sure you did, not only did Mr. O'Hart, you know, take reasonable steps to, to uh, you know, smooth over certain areas, but he, he planted grass, which is something I don't know that I've seen before in areas that um, have been the site of soil testing. Um, the comment was made regarding um, the building inspector having the final say, I, mean, I suppose that's right in the first instance, but as you know, just to clarify, we're here tonight because no, in fact, you have the final say with regard to this question. Um, it was mentioned that um, there may be wetlands on the property, and could you bring up the, um, the plan? Um, with regard to the presence of wetlands on the property and, and testing in proximity to the wetlands, um, is that the, uh, okay. So what's shown in the uh, cross-hatched area is uh, the wetlands. I think we all saw that we were on when we were on the site visit. It's pretty apparent on the ground. I'm told by Mr. O'Hart that, in fact, he approached the, uh, the wet town's wetlands agent prior to the test, or at some point, and, and received some confirmation that he didn't violate the Wetlands Protection Act. And as you can see, and as I think you saw on the site visit, none of the testing, certainly none of the testing is within a wetland, and it appears that none of the testing uh, was even within what we call jurisdictional areas or within approximately 100 feet of a wetland. Certainly no testing resulted in any soil or silt getting into a wetland. Um, mention was made of an ALTA survey. For those who that term may not be familiar uh, to, ALTA stands for American <coughs> Land Title Association. It really, that's a type of survey of which there are many types of surveys. There are as-built surveys, there are existing condition surveys, there's, um, there's ALTA surveys. That's inapplicable here. An ALTA survey is something that's essentially an underwriting tool for the issuance of title insurance. And it's generally applicable to large uh, developed or improved properties and the purpose of an ALTA survey is to show the location of those improvements and to demonstrate for the title insurance company where those improvements are in relation to property lines and easements and that sort of thing. So uh, the, an ALTA survey doesn't carry with it any sort of gold standard or magic. You have a survey. I trust that Mr. O'Connell would attest to the fact that this is, is accurate and it certainly 
I would suggest to you sufficient for your needs, present needs anyway, of determining where the, uh, uh, the testing was done. Um, there was also mention that, um, you know, it doesn't make sense to excavate large areas and to construct roads. As Mr. O'Connell mentioned, this, there was any notion that this is sort of a, a Mr. O'Hart getting the head start on road construction just, just doesn't hold water because but it doesn't he'd have to undo what he did in order for that yeah, to really become a road. It's not done to any particular standard. And it was also said that it, it, it makes would be more logical to, to dig a hole, determine where the ledge is or where the water is, and, and, and fill the hole back in. And as I think you saw on the site visit, by and large, that is what was done. I think it's correct to say that Mr. O'Hart pointed out many areas where he dug a hole, <coughs> determined depth to ledge or depth to groundwater, characterized the soil, got the data he needed, and filled it back in. There were, and you showed a picture of one particular area, which I believe was previously disturbed, but yes, there was an area or two where some gravel was, re was used to smooth out a limited section of maybe 50 or 100 feet of uh, typically or primarily existing car path. But it's not true to say that in every case a hole was dug and whatever was removed from the hole was used to build a road. If that were the case, then you, we would have seen a bunch of holes on the property and, and clearly we did, did not. There were no holes. Um, so in light of all of that, I would renew my, um, uh, oh, and finally, based on what was said and, and uh, with Mr. Luciano's questions about, uh, which seem reasonable to me, how, how does one proceed given this section of the bylaw if your intention is to develop your property? And if to develop your property there's a need for data, how does one proceed? Given that the question was asked, it sounds to me that the, the board has perhaps never um, heard uh, an appeal of a violation of this section of the bylaw and never, you know, perhaps th the, there's never been a violation of this section of the bylaw. Um, but in any event, as I said, we would respectfully renew our request that the board find, based on all of the evidence presented and the weight of the evidence presented by Mr. O'Hart, that Mr. O'Hart did not violate section D1A1 of the bylaw, I would respectfully suggest to you that a finding that he did violate that section would not be upheld on appeal. So we ask that you find that he did not violate that section of the bylaw and is not subject to fines. Thank you very much. Okay, one last comment, Lorraine. May I just, may I just provide the board with a copy of the minimum standard detail requirements for ALTA? land title surveys um, because they include evidence of recent land filling and land clearing sure. as well. Thank you. And this is by the National um, Society of Professional Surveyors. I got a couple of questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, I got a question for Steve, but for Bob first. Bob, could you please try to elaborate a little bit just because I think I don't want people to be confused as to the need to go into a site such as this. I know Mr. Luciano is questioning whether or not a water truck could get down to the lower section. Um, can you please give elaborate a little bit on, and if Steve wants to answer this first, Steve, you would apply for a 40B. If we didn't have three or four ahead of you, you folks would be coming to the zoning board to start your hearings. What additional testing do you need to do on that site before you were prepared to come to the zoning board. Since you were prepared probably two to three months ago already. But we'll have to do formal testing with the Board of Health to, 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 for them to observe the soil conditions uh, in accordance with Title V <coughs> for on-site sewage That will be disposal. after your approval from the zoning board for a 40B, correct? Yep, pre right. presumably. Do you have any, any other requirements you need to do before you appear before the zoning board? If during uh, if during the proceedings of the comprehensive permit, uh, revisions to the plan or in the preparation of final engineered plans, stormwater facilities end up in locations where there is no additional, you know, no, no testing or determine that testing that's been done is insufficient uh, from a quantity standpoint, then yeah, we would anticipate. Mm -hmm. 
potential. So you won't be taking any water trucks down there unless we ask you to for additional work. We you won't be taking any water trucks down there unless, do, except for during the 40B proceedings, correct? Prior to the 40B proceedings, you won't be taking a water truck down there, right? Prior to? No. Nope. Won't be taking a well truck down there, right? No, nope, not prior to. Won't be taking. There'll never be a well. Be truck taking any you know. big pickup trucks down there, low level pickup trucks down there, regular standard pickup trucks if they need to go down there. Prior to the something. Proceeding? Prior to the 40B presentation. It could be done at the same time. Could be, but probably not. Anything going down there? Why couldn't? Any anything going down there? To apply for a comprehensive permit. Uh, anything going down? You're applying for a comprehensive. Are you ready to come to the board for the comprehensive permit? Yes, we are. Yes. Okay. There so. Are so the water truck analysis, they mean it doesn't, doesn't hold any weight, or in this case we'll say it doesn't hold any water, because we won't be bringing a water truck down to any site down there. So the cutting in of roads Why won't we? for water, because you're not coming to the 40B. You just said until you come to this board, you will not be bringing a water truck down there to do any kind of testing, correct? No, we ex right. with the exception of the Board of Health. We testing. have the Board of Health under after you <coughs> meet with the Zoning Board of Appeals for 40B. We could do that. We could apply for that you, next week. You could. Yeah. And then at that point, you could ask, could you do some additional cutting? You could go to the building commissioner and ask him, we have to get down there. Could we do this? So the cutting in of roads to this depth, to flattening areas 100 by 150, to cre creating gravel roads, was all for the benefit of the applicant. They weren't to get water trucks down to lower levels. They weren't to help pickup trucks go down there. What pickup trucks are going down there yet? You've done your preparation work. How do you think we got a down there? A skid steer could get down those hills. His small excavator could get down those hills. We brought in a large excavator. We did preparation work to this site prior to the 40B hearing. Will, after the 40B hearing, all these roads be cut in? Absolutely, probably so. Will there be more taking down of trees and more clear cutting? Absolutely. But prior to the start of the 40B, these roads did not need to be created, in my opinion. You could have done the, well, the testing, which is what Mr. Bullock's concern was. The testing could have been done on the cart pass, which have been there for hundreds of years. Trucks have gone down them. Most of the people who live on that side of town have car park paths in the woods and can maneuver down them in pickup trucks. I can maneuver all the way from the power lines all the way to Turner Street in my pickup truck over the cart pass. And I don't have to worry about my oil pan. I don't have to worry about my transmission. And my truck is a standard Chevy pickup truck. So the cutting in of roads was for the benefit of the applicant. D1A, which by the way, says for non-residential uses, comma, land clearing, excavation. If you go then to D1A2, it identifies when you're doing single family dwellings. As we know, if it doesn't say it in either or, it's not allowed. So D1A is clearly the appropriate bylaw we're looking at because it says for non-residential uses, comma. It doesn't say for non-residential uses of land clearing. It just says for non-residential uses, comma land clearing excavation filling which is what mr bullock brought up now i'll ask mr bullock is there anything else down there any other reason why you feel they should have made these extensive roads that i've missed in my little analysis here no i, I it was my opinion that they they didn't need to it was just like the test pits that were done on the northeast corner there they they drove in over the existing grades they did the test pits you know, they could use a skid steer. They're not bringing in a water truck. They're bringing in, you know, um, jugs of water to do these tests. Sometimes a 55-gallon drum, but depending on how many they're doing. But something like that, they could bring it in a skid steer. But I don't believe that they need to do it with a pickup truck, you know, over nice graveled roads. So that, that was my opinion, uh, and that's why I brought it to the board. Okay. Where, mi where you're mistaken, Mr. Weeder, is that there was no existing cart path back here. So there was no, no vehicle was going to get back here with the exception of an excavator or like equipment. So the ex only existing cart path that existed, which when I first entered the property, started on Seekonk Street and are shown in black on this plan. So the purple lines are the result of the work Mr. O'Hart did, which I observed. And if simply knocking over trees for the excavator to gain access to those areas 
was the only part that was necessary, then you'd be right. Uh, but however, gaining access to those areas shown in, uh, in the, uh, the purple lines uh, took more than <coughs> just an excavator you know, for me to gain access to do the testing that I needed to do and, and expect and anticipate to do in the near future. Um, so when you knock over the, the trees, like I indicated, and you've got large holes in the ground from the roots that are uprooted, or if, you d if someone would decide to cut trees and leave stumps, that's when access with the pickup truck becomes impractical. I would add that um, it's, as far as the access by vehicles, the, the, the comprehensive permit isn't the only permit we need. As we've said, there's a septic system proposed. It, it happens to be in one of the furthest reaches of the property. Steve, could you indicate the location? So that's the location, the proposed location of the septic system. And yes, it's necessary to haul water to that location. We didn't do the testing for the septic system now. It's not necessary, and we probably oh, won't necessary. first secure yeah. the comprehensive permit and then, and only then, begin the process of designing and applying for the septic system permit application. That wouldn't make sense. And that is the reason why there's a need to haul water to that location. Yes, but and still, I come back sense. to the uh, <coughs> building inspector's letter. Um, I, I don't know that it matters what D1A2 says because D1A1 is the cited section. And in his letter, he says a major portion of the property has been cleared, essentially creating a gravel road around the property without the benefit of any permits or approvals. Again, what permits or approvals was Mr. O'Hart to obtain? Well, it's right in D1A1. He was supposed to get all permits and approvals, including, in, including a comprehensive permit, an order of conditions from the Conservation Commission, a septic system permit. He was supposed to get all of that before doing this testing. That just doesn't make sense because it's necessary to do the testing in order to get those permits. Can I ask you one question? Is this the first time Mr. O'Hart has applied for a 40B in the town of Norfolk? I think you know the answer to that. Well, is it? No. Is this the first time you represent him on a 40B in this town? I think you know the answer to that as What's well. What's the answer? No. So you have already gone through a 40B in the town of Norfolk? Correct. So you know the bylaws? And in fact, you know in that other 40B, Mr. O'Hart conducted testing similar to this, and there was no violation. Yep. We did extensive testing on the farm, Mr. Weider, and no testing permits were required. And as my engineer showed uh, earlier, the purple lines are the new pads, machine pads that we made, and the black dotted lines represent the existing car pads. So how are we supposed to access down here without creating the new I pads? think we'll have to do some further investigation as I think some of your neighbors feel differently on that and a number of them have said they've been back there with horses, with vehicles, with dogs, and there were car pads that exist. So I think we'll have to do some further investigation. The board will decide how we handle that to determine if there was actually some sort of car path in that area other than what you're showing on the map. I have a question for uh, Stephen. Um, in your affidavit, I did not see anything that said that the work that was done was limited cl clearing and excavation. Would you be willing to amend your affidavit to say that the work that was performed was limited clearing and excavation? If that satisfied the board. If you, and I, and I can elaborate by saying if you look at this map, and you look at the, the, the ratio of the of the, 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 the roads and, and access roads that are shown in relationship to the entire property, I would definitely classify that as limited. L limited ex uh, clearing and excavation to obtain the survey and engineering data. Yeah, yeah that's... Yes. One more question. Did the state tell you you could do unlimited clear cutting or unlimited graveling in your letter of eligibility? Did they give you free wheel or did they give you any conditions that said you could do whatever you needed to do to do this? In, in your statement, who specifically is the state? In your state eligibility letter, the Mass state of Massachusetts eligibility letter, mm -hmm. which you presented as evidence tonight. Yes. Did they give you carte blanche on whatever it took to get your engineering data? Or did they give you any conditions to give you ex greater than limited clearing and excavation? The state is uh, not in the business of granting 
uh, permits such as that in municipalities. That's oh, I understand the that. Municipalities I, 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 job. I spoke to the state, the fellow who wrote your eligibility letter, and he says, as far as he's concerned, there is no conditions. There was no conditions for or against you that allowed you to do extensive excavation work. So I'm just asking you, nor was did there we, something you knew that he didn't know when he spoke to you? Nor did phone? we argue, assert, or even represent to you that there was. I only submitted the project eligibility letter to you for the limited purpose, as I think I said, of demonstrating to you that the town expressed concern about such things as slopes, ledge, the presence of bedrock on the property. That concern, as we understood it, uh, relates to the development potential of the property. So in order to address the town's concern, and by the way, that is an essential purpose of the project eligibility letter. You're, you're eligible for a project, but by the way, here are these conditions or these concerns expressed by the town which we want you to address when you apply for a comprehensive permit. I think you'd agree, you folks are experts at it now, um, that that's uh, an, an essential feature of the project eligibility letter. Here's what the town's concerned about, so address these concerns in your comprehensive permit application. In order to address those concerns, of course, it's necessary to determine such things as depth to ledge, how uh, uh, steep are the slopes, what, how, what's the nature of the soil, what is the development potential of the property. So, no, of course the state didn't give us carte blanche to go on the property to clear cut it, nor did we, nor is the state in the business of doing that, or mass housing in the business of doing that. However, as we said, it was our attempt to respond, or to be able to respond to the town's concerns. Okay. Okay. Um, well, tonight we've heard some very conflicting right. testimony. Right. So, right. question? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tris Carpenter from 120 Seekonk Street. I'm on the, the lower corner down there. Um, and I certainly can attest to the statement, and, and as can uh, Mr. Clark here, that there are lots of cart roads down in that area. Uh, I've walked them. I've taken my dogs down there. Uh, and I know Mr. Clark here has gone down there also. And, and I'd like to, I guess, in listening to all this and having seen from at least from the back property looking down in there. Um, I, it just analogy comes to my mind, and, and maybe it doesn't fit entirely, but analogy comes to my mind is that, is that Mr. O'Hart took a bazooka to a knife fight. Thank you. Okay. Um, as I started to say, we've heard some very conflicting evidence tonight. The uh, job of this board is to determine um, what the level of pen penalty should or should not be, uh, and whether uh, the applicant jumped the gun and exceeded the scope of work that needed to be done. Um, I think at this point, the, um, this would be the recommendation. I'd like to discuss this with the board. The uh, Zoning Board of Appeals uh, will require the applicant to provide an ALTA ACSM survey signed and sealed by the applicant's land surveyor to document existing conditions for the property at 144 Seekonk Street. This should at minimum illustrate, but not be limited to uh, all the property boundaries. Number two, topography with contours at two foot intervals. Number three, all cart paths on the property. Number four, observed evidence of current earth moving work, for example, disturbed area delineation. Number five, topography of all disturbed areas, including spot grades uh, on a 10 foot grid. And number six, location of wetland areas as delineated by appropriate authorities, uh, delineation of flagged wetland resource areas approved by the Norfolk Conservation Commission in July and August of 2005, not to be confused with the flagged wetland resource areas proposed on ANRAD currently under review by the Norfolk uh, Conservation Commission. Um, that's the recommendation as a next step uh, to um, get some clarity on uh, all the evidence that we've heard tonight. Any comments? And who would be paying for this? The applicant. The applicant. Uh, Can you repeat that last condition about the wetlands? The uh, location of wetland areas as delineated by appropriate authorities, delineation, and it, we'll put this in writing for you. We'll, we'll spell this all out. I didn't know if it, requ if it required any dialogue right now. Uh, delineation of flagged wetland resource areas approved by the Norfolk Conservation Commission in July and August of 2005 
not to be confused with flagged wetland resource areas are proposed by ANRAD, currently under review by the Norfolk Conservation Commission. Uh, that specific condition wouldn't meet ALTA standards because wetland delineations from 2005 wouldn't be valid today. Wetland delineations under the Wetland Protection Act are valid for three years. Okay. So that partic particular condition would, would not meet current ALTA 2016 ALTA NSPS standards. Mr. Chairman, I had the farm surveyed for wetlands in 2010, and in 2016 I was not allowed to use the same wetlands flag, and we had a reflag okay. and brand new survey. So, and Mr. O'Connell did, did that. As an alternative, I would suggest that we utilize the currently proposed wetland resource areas, which are pending approval by the Norfolk Conservation Commission, and upon their approval, those will be locked, so to speak, for three years. And those will be the wetlands moving forward for the you know, three-year period. Okay. Lorraine, did you want to make a comment? And, and uh, while she's coming up, uh, that review process can add wetlands and it can take away wetlands. So what we're proposing is not necessarily going to be the final wetland. That's our request. Um, it most likely will change. Sometimes they move a flag a foot, sometimes they move a flag three feet, sometimes they think they find an area on the site that's wetland and that has to be debated between the two, you know, the two parties and ultimately gets decided by the commission. Okay, thank you. I don't want to argue whether or not uh, the old wetland flags can be included in an ALTA survey, but this board has the right to ask that they be shown on the ALTA survey because there is a distance of about 125 feet that's available now for a roadway to come through the, where the wetlands previously bisected the property. It was one of the reasons you couldn't get access to the back of it 10 years ago. Um, it, Mr. Andrews is right. Wetlands do change over time. And maybe they have, but I think it would be appropriate for you to do your evaluation and for the CONCOM down the road to do theirs to show both, maybe the present as well as what was approved by Norfolk's Conservation Commission um, and flagged and surveyed back in 2005, 2006. Okay, thank you. I, I think one very important thing we need is an analysis done on how much filling was actually performed on the site. A comparison between pre-disturbance versus post-disturbance. Yep, and, and I think if this, uh, this condition were to uh, be imposed, one of the conditions I heard was uh, topographic survey, and I think you'd have the, you, ha you can see the pre-development uh, topographic conditions there on that map, and if, uh, if, th if this is imposed, you'll, you'll see a, a current topographic condition in the areas that were disturbed that could easily show the comparison. I meant an actual volume number. Yep, yep. But the, the topographic information would allow us to yep. provide volume information. Yep. yep. So that, does that satisfy your concern, an actual volume yes. number? Okay. But I do want to reiterate, I cannot provide you an ALTA survey with 2005 wetlands. I don't know the source of those wetlands. I don't know. If, if you're looking for that information, I, I cannot provide it in the form on an, of an ALTA survey. You can provide that information on another plan that cannot be certified, I will not certify. Uh, that information is available in public record. Feel free to review it. If you need me to provide it, I'm happy to provide it, but I cannot provide that 2005 wetland information and meet the ALTA standards. Okay. Included in your, the public record information included in your uh, report? Sure. Yeah. You're, a you're asking me to provide it? Yes. Yeah, it's, yep, it's public information. I'll yes. be happy to provide it. Yeah, we want to see that information. Sure. Okay, uh, any other comments? If not, we'll uh, make a motion. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion. Have we, and are we having the applicant prepare this? Is Steve preparing this? Are you preparing this? I got the impression you are preparing this, Steve. I'm capable of preparing it if the board wishes. I think we want it an independent, don't we, party? So it's open for discussion, yeah. Okay. Do we yeah, I'll leave it open. I respect that the Norfolk Zoning Board approve having an ALTA ACSM survey of the property at 144 Seaconk Street be performed, including the boundaries, topography, 
character is the under, understudy vegetation, car paths, existing earthwork, topography of disturbed areas, location of wetlands, which will be identified in writing to the applicant and performed by a licensed civil engineer. I would say an independent licensed civil engineer. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, do I not have the right to look at, should that go out to the public bid? Right now we have a motion, so we, you can't speak yet. Um. <coughs> Yes, my, my engineer motion. is more than capable to provide that information, and I'd like to request my information. My inf engineer provides that. Yeah. Yes. We can, um, they can provide it, and then we can, in turn, after they provide it, peer review it, then get our. Well, you want to peer review it? Peer review it. All right. Peer reviewed it? Yeah. yeah. So once you provide it, we'll have it peer reviewed yeah. at your expense. Uh, so we'll amend the motion to have it done by Andrews Engineering to be peer reviewed by. A one of our consultants, yes. right? whether it be Beta or Tetra Tech. Okay. Okay. Exactly. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And, and we'll get this all documented and, and sent to you the exact uh, motion and, and the exact uh, work that we need need done. How fast can you prepare this? Let's see, what do we have? Are we on November 6th? Do we have November 6th, November 13th? Or December 6th, Thank you December 13th? Quick question. 11.29, when did they say they were going to be ready? You said 11.29, or do you want to go there? time for your peer review? Yeah, we need time for peer yeah. review. So you need, two to three. you need two to three weeks, so we want to, do you want to choose if we can get on the 6th? When will you decide your peer review? Hmm? When will you decide who your peer review is? At the Probably have meeting? to do that um, before the end of the week. Yeah. Okay, so you'll yeah. decide that independently. Okay. Yeah. So the 6th. You do the 6th, are we open yeah, for the December 6th? Okay. I don't have, I don't have anything beyond November here. So you're going to... Continue this to note December sixth. Yeah. Okay. Or we can say, uh, how, about, uh, how about if I do a motion to continue this to a date and time to be announced, presumably right now, currently December sixth, which gives you time to prepare it and time for peer peer review. So a motion to continue the public hearing till December sixth and or a date and time <coughs> specified prior to that for one forty four Seacon one forty four Seacon Street, the notice of violation appeal. Same motion. There's um, a motion. Does it continue the public hearing? Of the same, with the same motion. Correct. No, well, it's a different, okay. a different motion. Okay, second. Okay. We have a motion to do the survey. Yeah. Now we're doing a motion to continue public second hearing. Motion. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have one request. If it's a related matter, some of the neighbors have mentioned to me that they'd like me to do a little clean up on the front of the property outside the Silver Gate. I was wondering if the board would uh, have any objection to me actually tidying up the front of the property to make it a little more, a better appearance. Uh, yes or no? I don't think we have any objection. You'll have to talk with the building commissioner. He, it would be what I'd propose doing is moving the hay bales just off site and maybe chipping the couple of down trees that are stacked there. Uh, within 30 feet of the street, no, nothing on the inside. Yeah. The neighbors have mentioned it's of concern right. to them. Again, that's not above our pay grade. Okay. That's up to, that's his determination. So Check. talk to Mr. Bullock. Talk yes, to Mr. Please. Bullock. Yes. Okay, thank you. Motion to adjourn. So Chairman. You guys, wait, hold on. You guys need to continue the hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, yeah, yeah, we get, hmm? we're going to continue the hearing. Oh, we're going to continue the hearing. Sorry. Oh, my goodness. How did I forget that? <laughs> Ooh, that's a boo-boo. Are we moving that to the 15th? 15th. To the 15th. Okay. Nothing next week? I wanted to get them to watch the game. Yeah, we have a meeting on the 9th. On the 9th. Thursday. So you need to open the hearing, Mike, and then uh, somebody needs to continue the hearing to November 15th at 7.15. Okay. So we need to make, open. Yeah, make a motion to open up the public. Um, no, we don't have to open up the public hearing to continue the public hearing because the hearing's already open, Amy. Uh, okay. Betsy, yeah, so we don't need. Okay. So well, I, need, I need to make a motion yep. to continue the public hearing for Lawrence Street, the Preserve of Abbeville, and Lawrence Street, Abbeville Commons, until 11:15 at 7:15 p.m. I'll second it. Aye. Okay.
Any discussion? Uh, extending Abbeville because every this is more than the second meeting that keeps getting extended. It's being it's being continued to November fifteenth. Okay. Yeah. Are you at, saying at is the, the school, are you saying about the clock the one in yeah, yeah we've uh, we've actually already given the applicant asked the applicant to sign an extension Thank you. yeah okay um, in discussion all in favor aye aye, aye. Okay. Mr Chairman I make a motion to close the public hearing the uh, zoning board of appeal hearing at eight forty p.m. okay second second any discussion all in favor aye, aye. Thank you.